I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and welcome to Paranormal Almanac. That's right, I am your host, Kurt Sandig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, I have a very special, very long edition for you guys. And I mean very special. So let's skip the news, jump right in. If you want to know all about the following case, then I highly, 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 highly suggest you read The True Story, Unwelcomed, The True Story of the Moffat Family Haunting, by Deborah Moffat. You can find this on Amazon. Look it up online. That's Deborah Moffat, M O F F I T T. Unwelcomed, the true story of the Moffat family haunting. Now, there's a reason I'm telling you to get this book. A, the book is absolutely incredible. I got it off Amazon. It's phenomenal. I have never before, I might never again tell you, you have to go out and get something, but you need this book. If you're interested in the paranormal, This is honestly a must-read. Forget The Exorcist, forget the Amityville Horror. This is the must-read. Now, this book has accounts of what happened and also a bunch of photographs of what happened. It is filled with the most incredible true haunting tale, true haunting tale, that I have ever heard. And spoiler, I couldn't debunk the things in this book. I held the hundreds of photos in my hand and went over every one of them. Not only that, it wasn't like I just read this book and I want to tell you the story. Oh, no, 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 no. I went to the house and looked where the things happened, and I still couldn't debunk them. This one won't be a debunking episode. So let's get right into it. Now, it's time for a little backstory, okay? Debbie Moffat and her family were tormented by an unseen entity she named... Mr. Entity, from 1987 to 1992, and all of this happened in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Now, it roughly all began when the caretaker of their ailing grandmother performed a Santeria that unleashed something. This thing, which will be known as Mr. Entity, tormented their family and their house for six full years. Now, it was particularly attached to Debbie's mother-in-law, Lee, which seemed to be the focus of Mr. Entity. It would communicate with Debbie by writing with soap on the ground floor bathroom mirror. She'd walk in. There would be a story or a question or a statement from Mr. Entity. She could wipe the mirror, ask it a question, walk out of the bathroom, walk back in, and the answer would be there. Or a statement, another statement for Mr. Entity would be there. And it wasn't just in English. It was in multiple languages. It was in languages that Debbie didn't even speak. So if you're thinking she just kept doing this, she didn't speak these languages. On the mirror, there were symbols. And I'm not talking like the TV show Supernatural or upside down pentagrams and upside down crosses and all that crap. These are symbols that I know are the key to this. I know when it gets down to it, some scholar somewhere will match those symbols up with an ancient deity or an ancient text, and I know it's going to be the key. I just know it. But anyhow, back to the story. So things would actually manifest into and out of the house. In fact, it got so bad that they would have to check the seats of every chair before the mother-in-law, Lee, would sit down because they would find knives sticking up out of the seats. Knives would be shoved inches deep into the walls, Beds, books, and other objects would be thrown around the house. Things would appear or disappear in front of the family. And I know what you're thinking. Hey, Kurt, this is a poltergeist. Well, just wait, because even though we may never know who or what Mr. Entity is, I personally don't think it was a poltergeist. Like I said a minute ago, I went to the house. I found it very quiet, very inviting, and frankly, Just a beautiful home. 
I never once felt like anything off or evil was in the house. I was never afraid. I was never kind of apprehensive at all. I was shown where the events took place and was even allowed to ask anything I wanted. And never once did I have the feeling that Debbie was hiding something or not telling me the God's honest truth. I want that to be very clear. I, 100% of the time, thought that Debbie was very forthright, very open, and would answer anything. In fact, dozens of very notable paranormal investigators have investigated the house during the events, and each one of them walked away saying, this was real, and they didn't know what to do. So let me say what follows is just that. It's just a conversation with Debbie Moffat herself in her house at the table where many of the paranormal things took place. I didn't want to do a let's start at the beginning, then what kind of interview. I really wanted to hear from Debbie what happened and just let the conversation flow. And guys, boy, did it. I walked away again, believing her 100%, was astounded by by what I heard, and I ended it with more questions than answers. Not not at any fault of Debbie's. It's just that's how incredible this story is and how detailed. You got to remember, this took place over six years. Six years of torment from an entity. So Debbie has some stories, guys. And what I heard and the evidence she showed me was just absolutely true and absolutely astounding. Remember that. The evidence she showed me. Just wait till you see what that is. So look, I know you're eager to hear the interview, but before I get into it, again, I want to give you a little bit of story about who we're going to be talking about. There was Debbie Moffat. She's the main person that communicated with Mr. Entity by asking questions, and Mr. Entity seemed to sort of listen to her. And in my opinion, she is incredibly brave in dealing with this unseen entity that kept trying to torment or kill her mother-in-law, Lee. Uh, Which brings us to the next person, Lee. Lee is Debbie's mother-in-law, and she was the focus of Mr. Entity's attention. And and this poor woman was constantly tormented. And for reasons you hear, she was the one that Mr. Entity was most interested in. Next up, we have the father-in-law. His name is Bill. And he seemed to encourage or have dealings with Mr. Entity. I'll let let Debbie get into the more details of that. But, uh, yeah the father-in-law. Next up, we have Gary. And when you read the book, if you're like me, you're going to end up thinking that Gary is just this incredible character and you want to know more about him. Gary is a friend of the Moffats. He was just another person that was tormented over and over by Mr. Entity. Honestly, read the book. It tells you so much more. And then you also had the rest of the Moffat family. They witnessed the events. They seemed to be protected from Mr. Entity because of Debbie. Honestly, guys, She's so brave to stand up to and deal with this unseen thing for so long. Okay, that's out of the way. Those are the main people we'll be talking about. So instead of listening to me ramble on, let's hear it straight from Debbie, who again was so kind enough to invite me into her house, the house, and together with Todd Hendrickson and Jamie Hendrickson, who you might remember from an early episode, They're phenomenal. They're great friends of mine. Well, we all sat down and we had an incredible conversation about Mr. Entity. Again, book well worth the read, even after or especially after hearing this interview. And I'm going to tell it to you again right now. Unwelcomed, the true story of the Moffat family haunting by Deborah Moffat. Guys, get this book. Let's get into it. I, yeah, I got to say that, that that was the thing that I when when Todd's like, you got to read this book. And I think I had heard your interview probably with Arvell then as well. Um, there doesn't need to be any flowering to this story. The story is so intriguing and so genuine and so unique that I was like, why? This is exactly all you need for a story. So, all right, I suppose I should I should introduce. I'll do the actual <laughs> introductions. Uh, you guys all know me. And with me today, I have... Todd Hendrickson. Coming back again. That was uh, the second time. Uh, you're only the second guest that's going to return on the on the podcast. So nice. Thank you so much. And thank you for arranging this because I'm also with the very lovely. Debbie Moffat. That's right. Debbie Moffat. So if you guys don't know the story, I'm sure you're going to catch on pretty quick because we're just kind of 
going to get into it because there's a lot of things I want to know and a lot of questions I want to ask. But um, Debbie had, in my opinion, one of the most unique, I don't want to call it a poltergeist because I really don't think it was a poltergeist, but I don't know what to call it. Um, what? How do you describe it for people? Uh, it's very hard. It was like, it was. I felt like we were being controlled for nine years of our life. Nine years. It was about nine There was an seven. entity in your house. Yeah. yeah. And you don't know, well, you, there's, there's theories that we'll get into as well about where it might have came from and everything, but, but ultimately you never knew, or you never, to this day, don't know what the entity, day, who I, it was. I had no idea what Mr. Entity was. I, 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 there's all different theories, but I don't know. And so for nine years, the most bizarre things happened in this house from a, a, a death to a dog to... Uh, Actually, three deaths. Oof, that's true. I guess that's true. Yeah. yeah. That's the, the, oh, I forgot about this. Yeah. Um, and, and to the one that gets me the most is knives apparating. Is that the correct term? Yep, yeah, that's the right term. Um, apparating all over the place, including in the seats of chairs, right? Yeah, they were booby trapped. It was like, my, it was Mr. Entity had this, for, what he explained to me is he was promised my mother-in-law in the past in a blood sacrifice, which didn't come to fruition. So he came now to claim her. And he would do all kinds of things to torment her. Uh, I don't think he had the power. I, well, he probably had the power, but I guess maybe there's even rules in where he's from that he couldn't actually kill her. I got the feeling that he wanted her to commit suicide or, you know, or have someone else do it to her. Because I, if he had such power that if he really wanted her, if he had... To, could kill her, he could have killed her. I mean, there was no question Just looking about at it. the photos of the knives in the walls alone, it well, would have been very simple for that to have been her instead of a wall. Well, he was able to pick up a 2,500-pound truck and put it in the middle of the street. That... So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there was anything he couldn't do. And, you know, when, when you think about all these old horror movies with demons and all kinds of things, this was like a conglomerate of everything you've ever read or seen. There was a little bit of everything and some things that I've never seen. I was going to say, so, and, and things some that unique have, things. yeah, exactly. And that's so, the thing. Like if someone wanted to say, oh, she was just making this up and using a piece from the exorcist and a piece from this and a piece from that. There are things I was looking at the photos prior to this podcast, prior to recording. And there are things in the photos that I noticed that wasn't noticed prior that Todd noticed that wasn't noticed prior. So if, if this was all you and you were faking this, you would have to have the most intense knowledge of world religions, not even just Catholic religions, but world religions. And I'm guessing that you don't have a secret doctorate in world no, religions. I, I unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, you know, as, as you, the listeners know, I try to always look at something from I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of those. I definitely believe, but I want to look at things from a skeptic believer. And I really can't. Well, looking at these photos of knives apparating, knives going in through walls, I was talking to Todd about the fact that the force that you would have to push a knife through, even if it's just drywall, that force is someone would have noticed you doing it because you were with family in the house mm -hmm. and no one ever saw it happening. No, it was like you'd but never very few things ever happened right in front of you. I can only name, like, I told you, the bed starting to get up. Oh, spin. yeah. That happened in front of me, and I got a picture of it. Another time was I was coming in, a, a potato, a raw potato was thrown at my mother-in-law's head. I saw that. And there so, was a book thrown at someone's head. Was it Gary, Gary's? Yes. Gary, from when we used to have that open where the upstairs was a playroom. And Gary said, stupidly, why don't you show me what you can do? And Mr. Entity picked up a big, heavy Civil War book, because I remember the book. Civil War book and throw it at his head from upstairs. All right, so where were you when that book was thrown? Sitting on the other side of Gary. Was there anybody upstairs? No, nobody upstairs. Well, we didn't go upstairs. That's what I was just going to say. Because, <laughs> all right, so they... Again, I will, I'll will. i do the intro before, but the, with the book, um, when you read it, and you honestly, everybody should read this book. It is incredible. Um the upstairs was Mr. Entity's right. area. No one went up there. No. He started off in the attic. And then he started becoming violent upstairs, doing things that became to the point where my mother-in-law, who was petrified of this. You know, when I, like I said, when I talk about this, I'm talking about it in a completely different perspective than my mother-in-law. 
I wasn't afraid of Mr. Entity. I knew he couldn't hurt me. He wasn't after me, but you know, he, he did. A, 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 so he just, he didn't frighten me. My mother-in-law and my husband were petrified of it. This was the whole time he was here, they were in a living hell. So I'm talking very calmly about it because my memories are different than theirs would have been. And you went through, you went for it. Um, what I liked about it is that you went for it as if I focus his energy in conversations with you, if you focus the energy with conversation with you, he seemed to not have the energy to focus on your mother-in-law. Right. That's what it did. It got, got to the point when he would start talking to us, which he wrote on mirrors with soap. And these were conversations. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, ramblings. There was no. thought behind them. Yeah. yeah. He would answer questions. He would tell me things in the past, present, future. What, what, all right, so that, I'm glad you said that, because I, when I read that in the book, I was very curious. What did he tell you about the future? Do you know what? I don't want to go into things because, Ooh, I, okay. because yeah, I'd rather not say a lot of stuff. All right, well, let me ask me. you this. I don't need to tell people. All right, let me ask you this. Um, has any things that he told you yes. about? Really? Yes. Yes. I remember he, another, one thing he told us, um, we had a gentleman that we contacted. Uh, uh, what was his name, Todd? Oh my uh, gosh! The one, a Ro, a Rogo, Scott Rogo, Scott Rogo, who Scott. was in the, at that time famous. He had wrote books about the paranormal. He had one, wrote one right before we contacted him about uh, conversations with the with the, the dead through telephones. I think it was. So he was well known in his field. I had been trying to get in contact with him. I left messages on his machine, and then one day, Mister Entity wrote on the mirror, "Scott Rogo's dead," and I said, "He's dead." We have to understand, Mr. Entity wouldn't write in front of you. Sure. You would go into the mirror, he would have a message, or you'd go in to talk to him, and you'd ask him something, then you would have to leave the room. If you didn't leave the room, he wouldn't He wouldn't write on it. You could leave the room, shut the door for 30 seconds, go back, and the mirrors would be full. Uh, that was, I was going to ask you how long you had to be away for. So these, because uh, I looked at a, a ton of photos before this, that stuff was put on there in 30 seconds. That was boom, it was just up there. So you'd go back in, and he'd... He'd answer questions. He'd answer questions. So I said to him, he's dead. He said, yes, he was murdered. Uh, yeah, actually, it's D. Scott Rogo. It's uh, Douglas Scott Rogo. He was, uh, his murder, uh, 1990, is still unsolved to this day. He died at age 40. And and he thought, Mr. Entity said it had something to do with sex, right? Yes. He said there was two gentlemen. It had to do with sex and a robbery. And he said... That's what happened. Well, this hadn't been, we didn't know about it. It wasn't on the news. That night on the news, it was announced Scott Rogo was dead and was murdered. So he told me about it before it even happened. So the, the it wasn't just the extended future, it was immediate futures mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, so, he would tell us things like if someone was, one time we had a claims adjuster coming to the house and he would say, oh, he's going to be late. Don't worry, he's going to be about an hour late. So he would, I mean, it got, sometimes he would just have regular conversations like, one time we were going to go up to see fireworks display, and my husband had the date wrong. And Mr. Entity wrote on the mirror, there's no fireworks display today, it's tomorrow, you got the date wrong. Man. And, so, then, the, and then the next thing he'd be saying is, by the way, I want a blood ritual, or I want Lee dead. Uh, so I mean, it was like... Exactly, I was just going to say, you have the most basic, normal, everyday conversations with this thing you never see. You ne talking to something in a mirror... Or he, he, you didn't have to be in the bathroom. You could be out here and I can ask him a question. And he would answer it in the bathroom. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, I thought you always had to answer, no, ask it. You never, I never wrote on the mirror. Oh, wow. You only spoke it. You never wrote on the mirror. And then it would go from, like you said, the most conversational things to, there's a gentleman in the book. His name's Gary. You should definitely read about Gary. Um, he wanted a blood ritual sacrifice from Gary, piercing Gary's heart. <laughs> First, he wanted my mother-in-law, and I told him he couldn't have that. And he got so mad, he blew out all the windows. The house actually rumbled, and the whole windows upstairs blew out. That was that. That was in the night because it was in the middle of the night because it was. <laughs> he apported a spearhead. It was like what fourteen inches long, Todd. Roughly, yeah. Yeah, about fourteen inches long. Uh, in bed with my father-in-law. This at this time, my whole family, which consisted of my husband, my baby. Uh, uh, Ma, which is Bill's mother and his father, we all lived in the master bedroom because that's the only way my mother-in-law could sleep because wow. she was so frightened. So we all lived in there. So in in the middle of the night, my father-in-law jumps up, which my husband stayed up nights because he was petrified of the dark after this. To the day he died, he couldn't be in the dark. 
He never I, slept in the dark. I don't blame him. He couldn't go in. If like if he was in our bedroom, he would yell to one of the kids or myself to walk with him to come out into the kitchen. Till the day he died, he could not be alone in the house. Even though nothing had happened in 25 years, he couldn't walk out to the kitchen by himself. So, so it's like I said, when I talk about it, it seems sometimes, oh, it's not scary. But to, to my husband, my mother-in-law, it was, it was a, he was afraid for some reason that Mr. Entity was going to present himself as his grand, dead grandmother and want to hug him and then turn into Mr. Entity while he was hugging him. And he had that dream all the time. Oh, so, wow. So he dreamt yeah, about this. Yeah, he kept dreaming about it. So he, he just couldn't do it. So, so to other, to my husband, and this was a terrifying event. When I talk about it, sometimes I almost make light of it because sometimes when things like happen in your past that are, that are traumatic, when you think about the past, sometimes you want to think of the lighter things instead of going back into the dark areas. Sure. So that's just the way I deal with everything. But it's also how you dealt with Mr. Entity. Right. Because Mr. Entity had a, had a sense of humor. He did. One time we had... Um, Shaman's coming to the house. Yeah, he knew everything that was going on. I mean, you couldn't keep anything from Mr. Entity. He knew Shaman's were coming to the house. That night, we all went, we're in the bedroom, and the entire night he played <laughs> Indian war drums the entire night. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I laughed. So bizarre. My husband thought it was horrible. He was petrified of it. My mother in law slept with a pillow over her head. But to me, it was actually a very amusing because. It's Indian wardrobe. It was it's a so harmless funny. joke, yeah. 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 So he had a sense of humor. He did sometimes I think he did things just to make me laugh. Like when we were, when, once in a while we just had to get away from the house. But he would come with us. He'd pretend he wasn't coming. He'd say, Oh, you guys go ahead, have a nice vacation. I'll see you when you get back. That's what he wrote. I'll see you when we get back. Goodbye. Okay, so we'd go and he'd be with us. He'd be my mother in law would open up her suitcase and it was like full of water this much in her oh my suitcase. God. All her clothes were completely wet. So she had to, you know, it was like, he would always torment her more. more, more, more. Well, this time we went to this hotel. It was in Santa Barbara. And it was a, a, you know, a little hotel. It wasn't, but it had a court with all kinds of plants in it. My mother-in-law and her, my husband, uh, my mother-in-law and her husband were in one room. Myself, my baby, and uh, Bill were in the other room. They didn't have a connecting door. So you had to go outside Walk through the courtyard to get to the very next room. <laughs> this, for some reason, this really made me laugh. It was like ten o'clock at night. The baby had been with my mother-in-law because she adored my my son. So I went to get him to put him to bed, and I go to get to her door, and in front of the door, Mr. Entity had earlier that day when we had gone by this fern, which was a huge fern. It was like six feet tall. It was beautiful, and my mother-in-law said, "That's a beautiful fern." Well, I said. Before we go, Ma, I'll take a little bit of one of the bottom roots and we'll take it home and you can plant one like it. She said, oh, okay. So I go to get into a room. Mr. Entity had pulled the six-foot fern out of the ground and stuck it in the doorway. Oh, my God. So she opens the door and there's a fern. She can't even get out of the door. Well, I thought that was absolutely hysterical. My husband panicked. He thought they were going to call the police that we had stole the big fern. I said, Bill, why are they going to think we put a fern in front of our door? Yeah, but, but to him it was like, oh, we got to get it, we got to get this back. So here it is at night, and I'm we're dragging, the, <laughs> dragging a six foot, three hundred pound fern back and replanting. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. He was mad. It was like it's like like school pranks. Yeah, yeah, he would do things like that. He just sometimes he just did funny things, and then he would kill a dog. So I mean, there was like two sides. Well, that's and that's what when you said earlier, Todd, that. Um, you don't know if it was always the same thing or if he was bipolar. I think it, I kind of went with you on the bipolar thing. It seems like there's really high highs and really low lows. What? All right. So, Todd, you took a look at the spear. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. What do you think about the spear? Because this is the most interesting thing about this. Yeah, the spear is really cool. It's um, definitely one of the the most interesting artifacts that I've seen. Um you could definitely tell it's hand forged. It's not machined in any way. The, there's an interesting cross hatching across it. The, as a spearhead, it's not. It was never meant to be used as a weapon, uh, not for hunting or anything else. It, it's comparing it to the samples from the museums, the pictures from the different museums that I've seen. It was definitely roughly, I think, 250 years old from the Congo region of 
Africa. Um, it's but no rust. No rust at all. That's one thing that struck me immediately is if something was going to be this old and it's iron, why is there no rust exactly. on it? Because every museum piece that I've seen has it's either mostly rusted through or partially rusted through before they could preserve it. Um, and and finding a sample that, that looked like this spearhead in particular is really difficult because it was a ceremonial spearhead opposed to being used for hunting or anything else, which which are really a lot more common to find. Ones like these, they're they're very very rare. Um, but I did find a few samples that that really matched a lot of the findings they had from the museum when uh, Debbie went to go take it in there to have them look at it, which I thought was brilliant that 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 Debbie was like, oh. I know who to take this to because when you find an odd spear that just apparated in your house, you think, well, what the hell do you do with it? No, you take it to a museum. You have someone take a look at it. But what makes it ceremonial and not useful or whatever? It wasn't sharp on the sides. It was sharp at the tip and not on the sides. The cross hatching on it is very intricate. The level of detail that went into it is way more than would have been put into something that was supposed to be used as a weapon. This isn't used for, for, for slicing in any way. It's used for piercing. It's used for piercing at a straight angle. Like you said, how do you how do you go even? A, oh my God, she's bringing the spear right now. <laughs> oh yeah. Now, if you take a look here, you can see the cross hatching that goes across oh my God, this the portion. The detail of it. on this is way more than I thought. Yeah, and if you feel well, I mean, not not too hard, but you can feel on the edge right here. Not sharp on the sides, but the tip itself, at least at one point, must have been very sharp. It's 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 definitely sharp enough to puncture for sure, but this is definitely used, you can tell, because the level of detail that goes across the flat of the blade here, going across the part where it attaches right right here, even the small cross hatching down through this section at the bottom is really, really intricate. Well, the, the, the like, I don't know, like fishbone-esque parts of it right here are way more intricate than I thought. Oh, yeah, that is that is definitely something that, would, that was... Done with care. And it looks like, it looks clean like you, like someone just made it today kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And if you look at some of the, the pictures uh, from some of the museums that, that date around that same time, that 250 years ago, you'll see a level of detail, which is about the same as that. And the same kind of sheen, if oh, you were to, it, to it. that's the thing is, it's got the sheen to it, like it's new, but it's, it's definitely old. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. If it's only 30 years old. There should be some rust to this. Yeah, there's. Exactly. It doesn't seem coated with anything. No, I. I am. The st- fact that the fact that it hasn't gathered rust in the last thirty years since since it yeah it, it I was mean, imported it into the home it should have rusted just from just from the the air yeah, yeah the it, exactly the air. oxidization alone it should and, have some rust to it and yet and, it's not <laughs> and even on the inside there's none I am I am amazed by this this is way more detailed than I thought even like even though you describe it in the book there's a photo of it in the book. The detail on this is incredible. And photos just don't capture it. It, it doesn't. Like At the same time as being very um, primitive in a way, it's extraordinarily detailed. No, I mean, and you can tell, you're right. It's This is a very hand-carved or hand-pounded Pounded. looking yeah. thing. You can see the impressions going along the tip of it. It's not a mold, I can tell you that. I've done enough mold making and prop working to say... That this is not a mold. This was not a. This is not even a sand casted mold. I've seen those as well. My buddy does them on a daily basis. It's not sand cast. It is hand tooled. That's absolutely incredible. Even the hole that's used to adhere it to the wood underneath, right there, it's it's irregular. I was going to say it's, it's not highly a, irregular. There's it's nothing not a regular. Hole. Yeah. Even the lines that are used where they, where they tie the uh, where they tie the lines around it to kind of tighten it down. Are, are uneven so it's just very and that's the one thing that the one of the first things i looked at after i looked at the the, the amazing details is the hole because i wanted to see if it was a drilled hole and it's not a drilled it's hole a, it's yeah it's it's yeah absolutely that is absolutely well, first of all thank you for showing it to me because that is absolutely incredible but and i don't blame you for for keeping that because it is absolutely gorgeous except for the fact that it wanted to be used for killing yeah. a person for a blood ritual. That's it had to be used. He said this is what had to be used. He can't as long. I remember when I went in there. I said because as soon as my father in law, like I said, this was supported to him at, by his feet in the bed, and he jumped. And I we said, well, what's going on? And he said, and he pulled it out. And he, when I looked at it, and 
as soon as I looked at it, I took it away from my father-in-law because I didn't trust him. Sure. Yeah. And I said, this is mine. Because anything that belonged to me, Mr. Entity would not touch. Interesting. Like, that's, and that's you said it earlier, too. So it really seems like he listened to you. You could say, don't mess with my child. Don't mess with my mother-in-law. It, after my, he took my, my, my mother-in-law was in the pantry over here. He turned the lights off. She went in to get paper towels. We were right here with her, and, you know, watching television. She went in there to get paper towels. The door shut. We weren't paying any attention. We heard screaming. We went running. The door was locked. But when we opened it, it opened right up. She said it was locked. The lights had been turned off. She was on the floor just getting up. You could see bruises starting to form on her her uh, neck. Oh, my God. Up until this point, Mr. Entity had been all talk. You know what I mean? Doing things, you know, nasty things, but not anything physical to my mother-in-law. Sure. At that point, I said, no, this is, I don't even know where I got the nerve to confront Mr. Entity. Because even though I wasn't afraid of him, I also was afraid that anything I said that it rubbed him the wrong way, he could take out on other members of my family. But I went in and I said, this is it, Mr. Entity. This is how it's going to be from now on. I'm going to treat you with respect. You're going to treat me with respect. I'll accept nothing else. You're not to touch my child, you're not to touch my husband, and you're not to touch Ma, Lee. And I left. I came back in. He wrote, I will not touch your child, I will not touch your husband, but Lee belongs to me. That's got to be chilling. Like, I can't... And that's when he told me that when I said, what do you mean Lee belongs to you? Left, came back in, and he told me the whole story about the, the monastery and how there were monks and that she was a nun and she was to be sacrificed. She was promised to him. And it, but right before the blood sacrifice could happen, it was stopped. So even though it was stopped, he felt she had been promised to him. She was his. And he came to collect her. It's almost as if he was like a, like a dog. Like if you train a dog that you know is, has the tendency to lash out, but it listens to you. And he seemed to have that kind of a re relationship with you where you had to, to protect your family, you had to be stern with him, but it must have been terrifying to think, I've got to be stern with something that at any time right. it could be horrific, something horrific could happen. Yeah, see, I, like I said, I wasn't frightened for me because I know he could not hurt me. But I was afraid, what if he took it out on Ma? Because I couldn't be with Ma 24 hours a day. If she was with me, he didn't bother her. If she was away from me, he bothered her. So I couldn't be with her 24 hours a day. So, you know, I had to worry about that. He never touched my child. He never touched my husband. Never. Once he said that, once he said that to me, he never touched them. What did... All right, so I get how you felt. Well, your husband was terrified of him, rightfully so. Um, but you had to... There had to have been times where you had to leave Lee alone or right. leave your husband alone. So well, I wasn't too afraid of leaving my husband because I knew Mr. Entity wasn't going to hurt him. Because Mr. Entity, I know he, whatever he was, he never seemed to lie to me. Did I trust him? No, I didn't trust him. But I knew he wasn't going to hurt my husband or child. I knew he wasn't. But I knew he was after Ma. So that was when I'd be protected. I couldn't be with her all the time. I couldn't. No. I just... It was, bad, it was bad enough offense having to sleep with him. <laughs> Do you know, we're all ever, you know, enough's enough. And getting back to that, I mean, you've seen the size of this house. Sure. Having everyone just in one room. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, this is a very nice house it's with a, a lot of nice. rooms, yeah. especially having a whole upstairs area that they couldn't use for that long. One wow. Good, one good thing about the master bedroom is it has a big bedroom, then it has a sitting room and its own bathroom and everything. So there's plenty of room, you know. It's like, uh, well, it wasn't like a. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate yeah, Factory, you exactly know, what I'm all the buckets about, yeah. and all the buckets in one bed kind no, of situation. No, it, was, it, was big, it was big. It's a big bedroom. And it's downstairs. And, yeah. yeah. And, so, and this is really, and that's what I said when I first walked in. It's because I am in the house where this happened right now. This is being recorded in the house where it happened. And it is a very loving, very warm, inviting house that I don't have an inkling of. This is kind of spooky. I shouldn't be here. Or what's going to happen if I'm here? I don't have that at all. And, and you're right. It's a very big, very nice house. I just can't imagine you have this very lovely big house, <laughs> but you can't go upstairs. Everybody stays down here. Yeah. And, and one of the things in the book that another one of the things that, that really surprised me in the book was um, the waterfall. Can you tell us about that? Well, this was uh, probably in 89, I think it was. We were all in that room. With it. it was just TV room as it is now. And I heard like water running. And I looked over and I could see water coming in here. 
So I went out very carefully because there was water everywhere, trying not to slip. Went out to the hall and <laughs> looked at the steps and it was literally a waterfall coming down the steps. Just like if you were outside on the side of a hill and you see a waterfall. The, the, because the uh, living room is a step down living room, that was completely flooded already because the water was mainly going in there. So my father-in-law came, we thought, he said, it must be that a pipe burst upstairs. So he very held down to the side of the railing and started going upstairs up against it. And then I counted and it was the third step down. I always remember counting, where is this coming from? And counting three steps down. And it was come, just coming right out. Like he, my father-in-law said, there's nothing broke up here. I don't know, we didn't figure out where the water was coming from. I knew it was Mr. Entity. I went in and said, Mr. Entity, stop it. And just like that, the water stopped. The water didn't disappear that was here already. Oh, sure. The st water was still here and it was a big cleanup. Remember that, that was the night I called Lorraine Warren. Cause it was like, we gotta do something. So, and and there's no. I'm assuming there's no pipes. No, in that think, door. No, it's a closet, a utility closet. So. Yeah, just if you look right here, right behind us, there's. You could see where the stairs go up. The third step down would be right about maybe two feet directly behind me and directly up. Sure, and it would be very apparent if there was if there was a pipe there. Right, but then, of course. Now, even when you live with this stuff, your first thought is always something normal that broke. Not thinking, oh, Mr. Randy's putting water out. You think, oh, a pipe broke. And then when that's eliminated, then you have to go to the, uh-oh, Mr. Randy's up here. Yeah, the, there's something bad yeah, going yeah, on, yeah. 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 And then there was also water coming and from that, a light fixture That as well. wasn't that time. That was a different time. Later on, <laughs> there was just light. This one, that one, the one in the hall there, just water just dripping down. I oh, it was multiple. Pictures. Oh, yeah. And it was it was here, there, and there, and in the hallway. And the water was just, and there was no water above it. There was no leak above it. There was no the ceilings weren't flooded. It was just coming out of the light fixtures, dripping down. And it's really dripping in that oh, photo. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's a you stream. See it, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was dripping. And I remember we were, my husband said, "Be careful clicking that with the the light fixture. You don't know if there's water in there. What will happen?" So I went in and told Mr. Hunter, "You got to stop it." Got to stop this. And they stopped it. And it's never happened since. Nope. Never again. Now, I have a question. So water was always a theme with Mr. Entity. Yes. Did he ever use fire or yes. try to use fire? He used fire. He used to burn our mail in the mailbox. Well, yeah. Did he do anything in the house? Mm, no. The only thing he did one time when the ladies came to investigate. I was going to say that, thing. yeah. Yeah. He turned the, the burners on high, but he turned them on high, but... They were this high off the... About a foot and yeah, a half up. Like, yeah, yeah, 18 yeah. inches. It, was, it wasn't like normal. So they came in and saw that, and they were sc screaming through the house. It's not funny. No, <laughs> it's... But you got to... You would have saw these poor ladies. They, they came in so, you know, we're here, we're going to take care of it. And Mr. Entity thought it was hysterical. Because Mr. Entity used to love to torment people. And he seemed to love to torment or seemed to know that he could torment mm -hmm. people that were believers or trying to uh -huh. get rid of him. Uh -huh. He didn't seem to be... Was he ever afraid of anybody Nothing. trying to get rid of him? He said, he said, I don't have to go to Alamano. I don't... Nobody can get rid of me. And you know what? Nobody could get rid of me. And by evidence, there was a lot of people that came in here and yeah. none of them we could had, manage it. We had everything you could think of from witch doctors. I mean, we were desperate. And at that time, we weren't... I remember I was talking to a, a radio station in Canada... And the man just didn't believe me, which just because you don't believe me didn't mean it didn't happen. Exactly. You no, know? but I tried to, he kept saying, well, why wasn't somebody investigating this? I couldn't make him understand. We didn't want somebody to come to the house and investigate it. We wanted to get rid of it. Exactly. You were, it's not like, oh, this is, if you lived with it, you couldn't live with it. You had to get rid of it. And it's also, yeah. it's not like it happens today where I could go on Facebook and find you probably 20 paranormal groups in the tri-state area that was, would come to it in a there heartbeat. Was, there was nothing. Yeah. we. You know how we found out? We went to uh, paranormal bookstores, New Age bookstores. We'd look on their bulletin boards for, for people that would do. That's how we found everything. Because there was, it wasn't like I could, first of all, I didn't, we didn't even have a computer at that time. Sure. So we couldn't, there was nobody out there. And you also said in the book that you found, it wasn't just that you found legitimate paranormal investigators. There were charlatans oh, that came there, too. there were some nuts too. Really, I mean, I mean, there were some real wackos that came here. Oh, 
Yeah, and it wasn't just you that thought that. Oh no, they, Mr. They, Entity called a couple oh, yeah, people. Oh yeah, he was when he said throw a net over him. See, he, he this is so. It's, it's almost like Mr. Entity thought it was fun when they'd come. Did he ever? So he, he didn't hide. Oh no, he didn't hide from him. He wouldn't talk to him, but. But he talked to you. Yeah, he, yeah, he talked to me. Now these people that investigated when they came in here, or tried to get rid of them when they came here and. So they were. They saw that the mirror was blank. I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Then hanging out with you, and then they would see a lot that the of mirror wouldn't even come through the door. Really? Yeah. We had a priest come. He just walked to two steps in the door. Wouldn't go in the rest of the house. Well, you said that there was a police officer that was kind two, of the same two, as well. Two police officers came, and she was afraid they'd she come was, in. She was. She was afraid. He was. I don't know. He, he. She said, "I knew something was wrong the minute I stepped foot in this house." She said. Uh, God bless you, and I hope everything works out okay after we told him. They said as long as there's no more reports of dogs being murdered, we're yeah, not going to That was because of the dog. The dog, the yeah. Of yeah. The dog and, you know, to be have police officers come and, and think something, there's animal, animal abuse coming, you know, here and, and investigating that way, but there's really something else gone, and they just, they believe because they know it's, I mean. Yeah, they delay it to the guy. Said, okay, explain that? Yeah. That's exactly This it. is closed now. He said, if we, get a, if we get another complaint, we will be back. That's Jamie, by the way, that's asking questions and talking. I've just dawned on me that I didn't introduce <laughs> you as well, and that's very rude of me. I apologize. <laughs> Jamie's back as well. Um, but, all right, so to, I guess to get back to my question, so they, the investigators came, or someone that wasn't part of the family we're here. They saw the mirror was blank. Then we didn't. We, you know what? We didn't go into all the details with the police. Oh we sure. Went, yeah. When we came in, I explained to them because my husband was petrified of police because his mother was petrified of police because of her background. Sure. Right. So she, she, I, I like I said in the book. Sometimes I think she was more afraid of the police than the entity because she's been brought up that way with her father. Which I mean, and that's happening nowadays too. People are still brought up that way, yeah. which is bizarre, but. So they would see it blank. They would they would see we you. Didn't, we didn't even mention the mirror. We just when they came in, I explained to them we're having something paranormal happening in the house. It's sure, an entity here, tormenting us. He he did this to the dogs. I was trying to get help. Oh sure sure. I sent this picture to a lady. Now if I was we were doing things to dogs, but I sent pictures to people. Good lord no. No, I sent it to the lady saying, "Look, this is how bad it is. We need help," and she. Because I can't remember what it was. She wanted a large amount of money, and I wouldn't pay it. I said, no, this is because when, when they come and they want large amounts of money, they're not going to help you anymore. No, no, no. no. So then she got mad. She turned it over to the police. So when, And like I said, the lady was very nice. She said, I knew something was wrong when I came in the house. And the gentleman said, well, let's just stop this here. It's over. But if it happens again, we will be back. Yeah. And thankfully, I said, I said thank you very much. Yeah. And I remember saying, God bless you, and I hope everything works out. And they left. Wow. The priest took two steps in the house, looked around, big guy, he was an older gentleman. He, my mother, we, we didn't tell him what was going on in the house. We brought him at the, he was the very first person that came to the house. Oh, so he didn't even know he was coming no, for a Mr. He was coming. He was coming to bless the house. That was it. Just bless the house. And did something happen to make him do that? No, he it was when he took a step in the house. He just, he got, he would just, he got buggy eyed. Now, now did you feel the same energy that the police officer and the priest felt in here? You can feel, but see, you get used to it. When you live with something all the time, the abnormalities become normal. Sure. So I I was used to things. So like, it's like, it's just like my poor mother-in-law. She'd be, she'd be here sitting in and the knife would be right by her head right here. She would think now that she'd turn around, she'd pull it, get it out of the wall, throw it in a box. Oh my God. it's it's a hard way to live, but if something happens, and this stuff happened morning, noon, and night, it wasn't just oh once a week something would happen. It was even during the night, during the day, so it was constant. So you got to learn that things were going to happen. She knew that if that knife was there, it didn't it wasn't in her, so she just pulled out, put it in the box. We had a box this big full of knives that didn't belong to us. I was just going to ask that, and these aren't knives that are coming from the no, the kitchen. Were, some of them were real old knives. Some of them are all different kinds of knives. And some of them have bends in them. Yeah, we just threw it. After the box got full, we just threw it in the garbage. Wow. So, but you get used to things. Doesn't mean you want to stay that way. Yeah, you didn't want it. No, but... we, and, and it's a horrible way to live because you're isolated. And I'm sure that listeners right now or skeptics right now are going, well, why didn't you just move? We couldn't move. We moved once it came with us. Exactly. 
So it wasn't, and then like Ms. Lorraine Warren told us, this isn't, the house isn't haunted, Lee is. It's with Lee. So we couldn't, we couldn't move. What difference does it make if we moved? It was going to be at the new house. And and the the original place, because I you know I'm going to bring this up. The original place where it happened, it was the the house was torn down. There was three houses. It's on the corner of Archibald and uh, Arrow Highway. Mm-hmm. There Arrow Highway. Yeah, there okay, were. there was three houses. It was the my mother in law's house was in the middle, and the, if you're facing it on the left hand side was my husband's house. And on the other side was the grandmother's house. Uh, the grandmother lived with a, a uh, caretaker. Who? This is the way we surmise it all started. Sure, yeah. sure, yeah. This is all this, speculation. Yeah, um, she had a caretaker who practiced Santeria. The reason why she knew she practiced Santeria is because when she left, she found all kinds of paraphernalia like um, melted wax, dried blood, symbols, everything. So rosary Feathers. beads. Feathers, yeah, feathers, yeah. rosary beads in corners and things. So that's what, that's all when we told the experts, the so-called experts, again, that was, sure. they think that's what happened. She wanted the mother-in-law, my mother-in-law's mother to stay alive because she could stay in the country taking care of her. She had to go back to her country if she lost her job. So she, it seemed like she wanted to keep her alive. Sure. So when she died, she even, that night when she died, she went back to the house alone. And in the middle of the night, she called my mother-in-law and said, help me, help me screaming. And they went up to get her. She ran back to the house. by That was like 2, 3 in the morning. By 5 o'clock, she had called somebody and she was gone. And she told my mother-in-law before she left, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to do anything bad, but don't, don't go in that house. Get rid of the house. Just don't go there. It's not safe. And she left and they never saw her again. Oh, wow. So there's no, no idea what happened to her. Mm-hmm. And and, and then eventually those houses were torn down. People lived in them. That that's where the stuff started originally. And um, I wasn't here. I didn't come till 1987 to California. Okay. What but year this, was what, what this year was, was this 84. Been? Okay. Uh, at that time, nothing really happened. Little things happened, like radios would go on and off. Nothing. Nothing. You know, that you, you wouldn't just say, "Oh, it's electricity" or something. Sure. Uh, they moved somebody in the house in my grandmother's house. They rented it out. Uh, that person. Well, I remember once I asked my husband, not when I was here, uh, did somebody die in this house? And he said, no, nobody died in the house because my grand- her, his grandmother didn't die there. She died in the hospital. Sure. He said, well, and my husband said, why? He said, well, I've been talking to somebody on the Ouija board. So. Oh, oh, <laughs> I didn't know there was a mm-hmm. yeah. All right. So not only Santa Maria, there's a Ouija board involved. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So now I'm going to. The next Throw this tenor. over to Todd. <laughs> uh, um, so we were talking about thinking that maybe the Santa Maria opened up a portal but and it probably did. Mm-hmm. But if the portal was already open and then you started messing with the Ouija board, what what does that do? I'll just put it this way: what what could that do? Well, without any safeguards on it, without taking the correct precautions for it, you're in under normal circumstances. You're opening that door. If the door is already opening, if the door is already open, you're just cracking it open even farther, and you're 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 putting a wedge in there. Sure. Essentially, so you're you're inviting in whatever is whatever is coming through, and you're just you're, it's like throwing a telephone. Into you know, just throwing out a phone call into the darkness, saying, hey, "Hey, anybody, answer me." Yeah, wow, I didn't know about the Ouija board, so that's mm-hmm. definite. I mean, basically, where I'm getting to with that, why I brought up the other house is that um, that the houses are now long gone. Um, that, what what year do you know roughly? What year the houses were torn down or eighty eight? So from eighty eight till today, twenty eighteen, there's nothing there. Never been anything on there. And this is not just a tiny little plot. This is a big plot with stuff built first, around the, it. Right on the corner, the first plot didn't belong to us. It belonged to, I don't even know the gentleman's name, but they knew him. It was always empty. Then there was the one house, the next house, and the next house. So the whole thing, it's not empty. It's and this empty. isn't the sticks either. This is a developed area. Oh, right across yeah. from a brand new Back school. Back then it was more the sticks. I mean, we're talking <laughs> Rancho Cucamonga, El Paloma. But, um... When you sold it, because you sold it at that time, did they, they tore it down right after then? No, they tore it down about six months later. And, like, did they tell you what the plans were to do with it that lot, or they just no. tore it down? And I'm Either way, if you look, I mean, you can look at it on Google Street View or uh, look at an aerial photo of it. That whole area, it's very obvious that that was houses there at some point there were houses there because you look behind it there's houses there you look to the right of it there's the whole area is built up toward residential housing 
So it just seems like a big gaping wound right there where there's absolutely nothing but just a big dirt field where there definitely should be something. And if you look at every other corner, the other three corners of that intersection, there's stuff there. Yeah, it's not like it's it's a, a part of the town where if you, they tried to build something, no one would come to it. People are going to it. There are businesses on every corner. Hmm. Have you been to the corner in real life? Oh, yeah. plenty of times. You drive past it all the time. Oh, yeah. I would I would love to go there. Yeah. Um, do you have any impressions when you were there? Not really, no. Um, then again, I'm about as psychic as a bowl of potato salad. So <laughs> I, I, <laughs> How about you? Have you been there no, since? No, I, I am hey, by that. Driven by, reason, driven by. Sure. And I just, I just kind of ignore it. It's, and it shouldn't be because of every, because of the yeah. stack of photos that are in front of me. But it is one thing that just is glaring to me is why. So back. Then it was the sticks, but now it's really hard to find an open piece of land out here. Everything has been built up. Yeah. And this is in an area where there's been tons of businesses, there's houses. It should be probably houses. And, and Todd, you were telling me that it's gone up for sale and then, or even you were saying, mm-hmm. uh, Debbie, that there, there was construction that looks like there was about yeah. to start. Last, yeah, this was last year they had all kinds of machinery there. Yeah. And then still nothing. Yeah, every time a sign goes up there for for a real estate agency, eventually it comes down. Somebody goes through, rototills the land, flattens it. It looks like something's about to happen, and then the signs go back up again. Sometimes with the same, and sometimes with different real estate agencies. So I, I'm not sure what's happening, but that land isn't being developed. I don't. I have no idea why. I'm going to do more investigating than that. Don't worry. But I know you guys are probably saying, "Get off the land and get back to Mister Entity." <laughs> But the funny thing is, is at that time when they were looking for a new house, they were actually going to buy the house that my family was living in, oh, which really? is just down the block. Oh, wow. But they ended up with this one. I don't know why, but... They couldn't your father when when stop your mother from selling. Uh, uh-huh. right. <laughs> which brings up the whole other yeah. point. Like... So looking at the photos, there were, a, like I said earlier, there's a ton of symbols, a ton of symbology. And it's not just Christian. We're we just noticed, or you just noticed, I should mm-hmm. say, Todd, that earlier an upside down ankh, or possibly a what was that? The female symbol? Yeah, could be the female symbol. So th- I just can't get past the fact that all of the symbology was there, and possibly a name as well, right? He did Baal. Baal, B A A L. They all put all kinds of names. But he's, he's prince too. Yeah, prince. He wanted to be called prince. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he said. The very first thing he said is, I'm Prince. And and you said you wouldn't, or you thought or whatever, you said, I'm not going to call him I'm calling you Prince. Why Why did you say that? Because uh, to me, that gives him power over me. Oh, I agree. Okay, so I don't call you Prince. I'm going to call you what I want to call you. And did you immediately start calling him Mr. Entity? Yeah. No, actually, I, stalled, I just referred to him as the Entity. When I said to him, okay, I'm going to treat you with respect. You're going to treat me with respect. From that time on, I called him Mr. Entity. I gave him the Mr. <laughs> as a concession. Did he say anything about that? No, he didn't care. I was, he was okay with me. <laughs> that's just amazing to me that you, you were like, yeah, this is what I'm going to call you now. He's like, all right, I guess that's what I'm going to be called yeah. now. And he responded to it. But see, I never, I did, did give him respect. Sure. I did because I just way I give anybody respect. Sure. But I want it back. Sure. And that's the way it is. But I never I never yelled at Mr. Entity. I never called him names. I never did that. As a matter of fact, it got to the point when I would go this is how long he was with us. I'd go by in the morning and I'd say, Good morning, Mr. Entity. And he'd say, Good morning, Debbie. No kidding. Yeah, it got to that point because he was like he lived with us. Why didn't you ever say like a from the get-go, like, once you realized there was something here, and it wasn't just your imagination or electricity or whatever, why didn't you say, get out or scream? Okay. I said, you have to go. You have to leave. You can't be here. And he said, no, I, I be- leave belongs to me. But you never got angry. No, I never got angry. Interesting. What, I mean, what are you going to yell at an de- entity, a demon? I can't see him. Sure. I can see things he can do. Sure. Well, I'm not going to, like, poke the bear. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what it, I mean, because the reason I ask that is because people say that to me all the time. Oh, you got this thing in your house. Why don't you tell it to get out? Why? If if it's going to leave, it's going to leave on its own, and it's just part of it. I get what you mean. It, I kind of, I mean, mine is very benign and not anything like this, but I kind of get what you mean, that it's just, you just start to accept it, and it's just part yeah. of your every day. Yeah, it, it became that. And don't think we didn't try to get rid of it. We tried everything possible. We didn't want Mr. Entity with us. 
We didn't have a choice. There was nobody that said, okay, well, they used to say, we'll come and help you and get rid of it. They'd walk away saying, we're sorry. There's nothing we can do. We're sorry. We're sorry. And then Mr. Anthony would laugh and say, I, I don't have to leave. There was such a list of people that came into. I mean, that's one of the things that, that really got my attention off the bat is the names of the, of the people who came through here. Sure. And these are the luminaries of the 80s and 90, or late 80s, mid to late 80s, early 90s, who really pushed the, the boundaries of the paranormal fields. Like who? You're, you're talking about Lloyd Arbach, um, Evelyn Pliglini. Um, you're talking about well, the Warrens. They were here. Um, gosh. Atris Chacon. Um these are names that you guys, I guarantee you, you know at least a few of these names, and they are the leaders of the paranormal community, as far as I'm concerned, from back in the day. And they all walked away, none of them walked away going, there's nothing going on in the house. No, no, they just said, there's nothing we can do, we can't help you. So they and all... Like Chris Jacone said, there's some things in this road you're just never going to understand. And he left. Now, you said that, that Mr. Hennedy told you about the past, the present, and the future. I won't go into – I'm not going to ask you specifics. But now, did he ever say that he was coming back? Or did he ever give you any indications that, you know, that in the future, you're going to have to deal with him again? No. I, I, I told him he had to leave. He had to leave. I said, you have to go. No, it's time for you to go. You have to go. He said, please, I don't want to go. He actually asked to stay. I said, you can't. You have to. You have to leave. So have you? I, I already know the answer, but I'm asking. Have you ever regretted that? Regretted it? No. Because uh, my kids, one was like me. The my daughter's like me. She'd have been talking to Mister Entity, you know, to understand because it's an amazing thing. Sure. You know, you don't want it in your life. You don't. But if it's there, learn from it. Yeah. But she's like that. My sons, they don't want anything to do with it. You know. They, so I, I, I had, had to go. It wasn't, I wanted my children to live a normal life. He's not part of, Mr. Entity wasn't part of a normal life. He had to go. Sure. So he, he left. He left with Gary, but he didn't say, stay with Gary. He, so he, he, he hated Gary. That's the interesting thing about the book is that, that it's odd because Gary almost came off like a character, even though I know he's a real person. When I was reading the book, <laughs> he comes off as such a character. And then when you find out, and spoiler alert, but you should still read the book, it doesn't matter, um, that... Mr. Entity leaves with Gary. Mm -hmm. and Gary. Gary was desperate. He had nothing going on in his life. He had seen the things Mr. Entity could do. Well, why do you think Gary wanted that? You think he because, was expecting profit? Oh, from yeah. Him? He thought, he said to Mr. Entity, together we can become famous. We can become rich. Mr. Entity wanted nothing to, like Mr. Entity wrote, I will not work with an inferior being, which I think is a, it's such, such uh -huh. a line. And I think, that's what I think of Mr. Entity, and I try to think what he is. What, what, in another, in another dimension would say, I won't work with an inferior being. It wasn't calling him filthy names. Mr. Entity didn't swear. Very rarely swore. Sure. He, it was, he just didn't. And I don't, I don't, when I think of things like that, I just don't think of how Mr. Entity was. That's why I'm so confused what he was. I'd love to know what Mr. Entity was or who he was. I would love that as well. And I honestly, I'm, I'm dumbfounded that there hasn't been numerous investigations into Mr. Entity. Nobody ever asked. At the time, what? at the time, the investigators that came through here did their best. But sure. with limited resources. But that's exactly it. Times have changed. Yeah. Like, this should be one that people are jumping on just in the, just in the symbology of the photos alone. You, you discover where the, each of these symbols come from or the, all right, so that brings me to the, the main symbol, Mr. What we thought was Mr. Entity's symbol mm -hmm. that you, was it, did you find out, Todd, where the symbol came from, or was it you, Debbie? Where who found out that the symbol meant something else? It wasn't it just Mister Lisa. Yeah, it Lisa was did a, a friend of ours. Of ours. Um, she, yeah, she, she kind of pointed us in the right direction on it, and then I followed up with a friend of mine who is uh, very much into Middle Eastern studies, very specifically um, Middle Eastern metaphysics in regard to the jinn. And he took a look at that that symbol, and it, it jived with. Um, Something within the very, very slim realm of gin magic um, for teleportation. For move, specifically, I don't know if it's used in that term, but moving objects from one place to another. Which, if you look at what occurred within the house during that time period, yeah. that makes perfect sense. And I can't believe I hadn't thought about that sooner. I just it, it hit me like a ton of bricks when when that was mentioned. Where he was like, "Oh yeah, that's 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 was that's not his calling card. That's what he was using to perform 
the you know, specific type of magic to get things to move from one place to another. Oh, and you put that everywhere. And it really walls, was. Floors, yeah. mirrors. I mean, just making this pl- did in walls. And God, essentially, by doing that, making this place into just a hub where things could be moved from one place to another. Well, he, he used to bring all kinds of stuff. <laughs> he was like, when we'd be sitting at the kitchen table. We had two two uh, dressings, two Thousand Island dressings. I remember this. There was one half full and one new. And so we put the half full one on the table. And my mother-in-law said, leave the other one in the refrigerator because we don't want to open two. We turn around and there's both of them on the table. I mean, wow. it, it was just like, because it was like right with us. Or Gary getting his hair cut. That's that's a bizarre story. <laughs> and was it here? I'm sitting, right where I'm sitting, Gary was. I was sitting where Todd was. And we're, we're having lunch. And I hear clip, 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 clip. And I say, and I see Gary like doing this. And I look over and hair is falling down to the ground. And it's all his hair is gone from the back of his No oh scissors, God. but the sound of scissors. And his hear hair is the just on the, the ground. Scissors, and then Gary goes, oh, my God, my hair is being cut. And he looks and he goes running out of the house. Oh, that is bizarre that that's the kind of stuff that he was just messing with Gary. Yeah. And it's here, well, like, right he, literally he took, where we're he, sitting. Gary used to use this bathroom to take his showers. And we used to walk, because of Mr. Entity, we were very protective of Jamie, the baby. Sure. So we couldn't just let him walk around the house or anything. He was just learning to walk. We used to get in the long hall here, over here. And one of us would get on each side and call him and play with him so he'd walk. Sure. So we get him to walk. Well, Gary used to always have to go buy us to go into the bathroom <laughs> to take a shower. Well, he was he had on his bathrobe, which he loved because he got from he got from a guy that's very famous. I can't think of his name. He was a guy that did a ports for not a ports uh, by locating. Oh, oh gosh, I can't remember. I know that at one point we had struck on yeah, it, but yeah. I can't remember now. But it belonged to him because Gary, when he died, got a lot of his stuff. And Mr. Entity. Gary goes by. Mr. Entity had cut the back end out of the, <laughs> the 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 bathrobe, so just his back end was sticking out of the bathrobe. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, so he did he did very funny things. I remember laughing. Bill actually laughed at that one. This is this whole story is just amazing to me. You see, but we're like I said, we're touching on the funny stuff. But then there was Mr. Entity who constantly tormented Ma. Sure, she couldn't even have her wallet. I used to have to carry her wallet because. If he, she, she had her wallet, he'd cut up her credit cards. He'd cut up her oh my license. God. He'd c- cut up her money. So I had to carry her wallet. We went any place, anything the mentor, I had to carry it with me. And you had to check her seats, the, yeah. all the seats, it, too. It got to the point where, like, she always sat here. Before she sat down, somebody would have to check the seat because he used to put knives. So then blade would come up, so if she sat down, she'd sit on it. Or in the bed, he'd put in the pillow knives, so if she put her head down, it'd go Did she bed. ever get cut? I don't. Well, I can't remember ever really getting cut. So it can't be that she ever got caught. Sure, but that's but terrifying. We very, and the tiny glued, glued her to the bed. Glued see, her not, to the bed. See, that's not funny. It's, but it's it, not funny, but, but... It's not funny, but when you look back at it, and you and I think of the situation, I remember she had said the night before when she went to bed, she was so tired of being in this room, she felt like she was glued to the bed. That's what she said. Wake up in the morning, she's screaming. I run over, what's the matter, Mom? What's the matter? He glued me to the bed. There she Oh my I'm trying to remember, God. but there was another. And he actually, we oh. had to stand, take the sheet off with her, with hook to it, stand her up, and peel the sheet off her. See, Jeez. but in, in a way, it was it wasn't like he could have super glued her, but he didn't. He used a glue that came off, and we could pull it off without really hurting her. I'm trying to remember. There was a uh, another ask as well. Yeah, another. Yeah. No, no. Some of her hair came out. Oh, There's know. another series of events that happened. I think it was with the uh, remember the Black Hope, the uh, the the events that happened in Black for the place that was built over Black Hope Cemetery. I can't remember oh, where it oh, was. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, that was roughly what they ended up basing Poltergeist yes, off of. That's exactly it. Where references were made by people inside the house. Um, one of the one of the women was saying, "Oh, you know, I I feel I feel so green, you know, referencing that she was feeling ill. Then all of a sudden, she did come down with some horrible disease that made her face actually turn greenish." Um, things like that happened in the house in the, as reports to those. And that was back, I think, just probably before, I must have been the mid-70s, I would think, um, where that same type of thing was happening, where people would make references in the house and then they'd come to horrifying, literal yeah. fruition. Yeah. So it's the same type of thing, possibly, was listening and, and making these things happen. 
And you tried to save the house too, right? Oh, we had the, the, the Indians came. That's where I saw Mr. Entity. That's why I was yeah, bringing this yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. They staged the house, but we, this is, he was, remember he was upstairs. We went upstairs. For some reason, when they, they came, people would always say, you come with us. So I'd have to go with them. So I went upstairs with them and they went through each other. He had a, he had a feather and he had some other, and he was saging and chanting, right? And he, he said, he's in this area, the attic. So they opened the attic door and both of them had the sage and they were blowing it in. They would blow it in. A second later, he would blow it out. Oh my God. They would blow it in. He would blow it out. So, and it wasn't like it was a, a constant thing. He, he at least allowed to be blown in. So it wasn't like a differential in, yeah, there was in no, pressure. There was it wasn't a, a draft yeah, blowing through the house. No, was it went it was, yeah. And then two seconds later, it all came out again. So they said, we have to go in and that's where he is. So they went in. I stood right in the doorway. When you stand right in the doorway, click the little light on there. You could see. Okay. Yep. At that time, there was pink insulation mm -hmm. on the walls and everything. And he said, we're going to demand that he shows himself. And he did some kind of chant or everything. And I watched, I stood there and watched as the pink insulation on the walls came down and formed into a huge head. Oh, my God. Now, this head must have been five feet. It was just head. Nothing else but head. And it was the whole part of the room. And all I could see was the side. I couldn't see the front. He, the, he was facing uh, Fire Panther, I think it was. He was facing Fire Panther. Mm -hmm. I just got to see the side, and it was this huge head, real big jutting jaw, real strong jaw. Because I remember saying, wow, look at that jaw. It gave the impression of somebody who was like a muscle man, you know? Real high cheekbones, like flat here, but real high cut cheekbones. A big, big nose. Not a funny nose, but a big, strong nose. Sure. That kind of didn't start here, but started like up here. And then on the side of his head, instead of an ear, there was a horn. And it started here. And it went like this and came out of the top of his head like this. Oh, my God. Like, like a ram's horn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it came out. Spiraling like this, upward and out. Like this over the top of his head. And I stood there and I just looked at it and I was stunned. I could just close my eyes and picture it to this day. And then it slowly just dissipated and fell to the ground. Now, the or, oh, I should say for the everybody who might not know what a gin is. A gin, think of, a, unfortunately, think of a genie, like a genie in the bottle type thing. But a gin is the basis of that story that's not really like that now todd do they have are there descriptions of jinn out there oh there are um there's plenty of them going back all the way to the quran and yeah horns are a big part of that that's especially, what I was ask. especially what we're talking about a specific type called an afrit uh, it's an underworld jinn um jinn from a lot of different accounts can be described as at best mercurial and playful and at worst, absolutely terribly destructive and purely evil. But huh? What does that sound like? Yeah. But well, unfortunately, it sounds like humans. Well, yeah. that's because, true too. Because in a lot of ways, that's one thing that they're described as. Um, going back, the the mythology of them is that they were first created before humans, as where uh, humans were created with uh, with earth and water. Jinn were created by fire and air, a different elemental construction, um, which allowed them different abilities than humans. If for lack of a better term, fifth dimensional beings, something that could, that exists on a different vibrational state, whatever you want to call it. I guess it, it all boils down to the same thing, occupying the same space, same time, but on a different level. Why would Jin care about humans? Do you? I mean, I, this is all conjecture. I know. I apologize if you can't, if you don't know the well, answer to it. From what I can understand, at least from what I gather, uh, they became jealous, just like the angels did, oh. and have just like the, during the re revolt of the angels. There's sure. actually two different storylines which kind of go side by side one saying that it's that it was the archangels and some of the uh, portion of the angels and archangels that rebelled and some of them say that it was the jinn if you look at old old middle eastern lore some of them instead of saying that it was the ar archangels and the angels that rebelled that it was actually the jinn that became jealous of humans and the attention they were getting from god and the fact that they were no longer being paid any attention to or not having the proper tribute paid to them or you know by these lesser beings these humans these 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 dirt and water monkeys that are coming up huh. <laughs> that just got you know, these, these newcomers. Can you they were no longer the favorites. You can, um, from what I understand. Um, once again, I'm going by what I've learned from sure. my friend who studies this exclusively. Not easy. Extremely difficult. We're talking on the same level as performing an exorcism. Maybe a little more difficult because, as stated in these lores, there are several different types of entities. You know, of course, you've got 
the, the jinn, but you've also you still have demons. They still play into it. Sure. Um, there's more things under heaven and earth that can be under, understood by one set of philosophy, looking at it from a metaphysical point of view. And it's equally as difficult, if not more difficult, to drive out a jinn, especially a powerful jinn, one that's been alive for a very long time, um, than it would be, say, a demon or a prince of hell kind of situation. And Debbie, you're not the only one that 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 saw Mister Entity, right? The two. Uh, no, the no, shamans. Uh, the shamans as well. I think, yeah, that's true my, too. My, um, but your your mother in law, uh, yeah, she saw when she was in here. Which my father left her alone. Father in law left her alone, which he wasn't supposed to. And she saw like a head, but the hair was moving. Oh, yeah. so it was different. Like then. a like yeah, like a Medusa type thing. Huge head, Medusa type thing. The hair moving around her, and the hair and it just. The, it came at her, and she went running. And we were in the bedroom, and she went running. The door was shut. She hit that door, and it popped open. Oh and my I mean, god! She was petrified. I don't know what to think about this. I constantly, I a hundred percent believe it. it. There's no reason to do. Looking at those photos, there's no reason to do what you did to your house. You weren't. As far as I can tell, you're not looking for fame and fortune in the 80s for this story or anything. No, we were offered a time someone came to offer to make a movie about it. Dr. Paglini actually brought somebody to make a movie. And we said, no, we don't want a movie. We want it gone. So there's no financial benefit to this. There was no, you weren't trying to become a celebrity from this. We just wanted to live a normal life. Yeah. I, as far as like, I'm trying to think this skeptically, and I can't think of a reason why anybody would do this. It's not... A bipolar person in the house. There wasn't anybody. If, uh, if the listeners will know, there's nobody of puberty age in the house, so it's not poltergeist as well. I just can't get my head around, you know, why anybody would fake this if they were trying to fake this. There's no reason that I can think of. Or wait thirty years to write a book. That's no. true too. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> From a personal standpoint, I mean, my mom was married to Bill's cousin. Her, that was her first husband and they divorced um when my mom during this time of like 1988 1989 after she had divorced my dad she looked to debbie and bill to come stay just on the couch she just needed a place to stay sure and i don't know if we were staying with my dad at the time or if she wanted to bring us too but she just needed a couple nights to stay, and they consider her family. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they turned her down at that time, and she could never understand until this story was told why she was turned away. They never even told their best, you know, their best friend, their well, close, their closest remember, friends about this it. Was and back family. In 1987, when it started, it wasn't like now where people were open minded. Sure. Back then, you were a nut. Yeah. Yeah, you were nuts. nuts. Yeah. You were nuts. So you just so, never spoke of it? No, we spoke of it. And, and he would do things. Like, say we went to a friend's house at the very beginning we did. We went to Ma's friend's house to, to talk and just to have dinner and everything. He, When we left, Mr. Entity took the man's wallet. Huh, that's right. And put it, on, it, and it onto the home, table, yeah. And we had his wallet. Now, how are we going to explain to this gentleman? We were just at your house, by the way. We have your wallet. Your, your wallet just appeared <laughs> on the table sorry, in front of us. Sorry, that's, it wasn't us. You know, something's <laughs> missing from your house. He would do, we'd go to, if we went out for pizza, he would, he would bring the pizza scoopers home. And every time he, whoever waited on us, their name tag, he'd be waiting on the kitchen table when we got home. Before you got home? Yeah. We'd come in the door and it was on the kitchen table. Unbelievable. So it was like, wherever we went, he went. We could, or my mother-in-law, she'd look down and she'd see bites in her food. I mean, she, she, she had, I remember she had a nice piece of meatloaf and there was this big bite in it. And she, she said, look at this. So she couldn't eat it because yeah, things like that. See, you, you know, it's like, and you think of that constantly. Think of living like that. Think of living that there's knives next to you. You, you can't sit down. You can't have a piece of cake because Mr. Entity spikes it with aspirin and you're allergic to aspirin. Oh, that's true because Lee was allergic yeah. to aspirin. Your mother-in-law was allergic yeah. to aspirin as well, yeah. So think of the how to live. Now, one, you know, if my mother-in-law didn't have such a deep faith in God, she never would have got through this. I'm shocked that she didn't, that it didn't break her faith. Because for a lot of people, that would be it. No, never broke my faith. She said, God must want me to go through this for a reason, and I'll do it. Or I guess it could also strengthen, strengthen it in a way. your faith. Yeah, yeah. So you have one, you have the other. It, it, did this. Yeah. it strengthened my faith. Because I was a believer in God. But, you know, there's always doubts. But once I met Mr. Entity, and I realized there's evil, 
there's got to be because there's, 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 there's got to be a balance. Yeah. So it it strengthened my belief in God. Yeah. So. Yeah, even just researching this case, looking into it, I had to blow wide open my my ideals of what exactly the paranormal was because I walked into it thinking, okay. I've been researching paranormal phenomena for a good chunk of my life. Yeah. I'm sure I've heard about something like this. And when I didn't, when a lot of things started not adding up, I really had to redefine my my description of what, what reality really is. You know, and, and once again, I, I you know, walking with a skeptical yeah. outlook, you yeah. know, trying to think, okay, this can't be real because of XYZ. Exactly. And then having all these people that I've looked up to for so long in writing tell me. Just flat out tell me, oh, yeah, it happened. And it happened exactly the way that she said it happened. I've got, you know, this, she's I've got pictures. There's documents about it. It takes away your ability to not disbelieve. And then what are you left with? You're left with this, this belief that's based upon a bunch of new information that you now have to accumulate and, and kind of absorb into your, your life. Yeah, I'm walking away with more questions than answers now. That's and what... that's got to be so frustrating for you. Oh, it is. I would love someone to that really knows what's going on to say, listen, this is who Mr. Entity was. Because, I mean, I, you can tell me, but I don't know. Everybody has a different answer. Now, why don't you think that he ever just flat out said, this is me, this is where I came from, this is what I can do? No, I, I, I just think he wanted certain things private. Certain things he wasn't going to tell me. He would tell me about his, some things he did in the past. He, had, he, he worked with Cardinal Reslew. Cardinal Rushlew, I don't yeah. know who that is. Um, this guy, it sounds like that'd be a while ago, a, though. Yeah, a long time ago. Was, he was a French French uh, bigwig or something on some kind of doctrine. Now, did you and, know? have you ever heard of Cardinal Rushlew prior to that? And he talked about Madame. He would refer to, refer to Madame Dewberry as the left-handed whore. What does that mean? So, yeah, looking at Cardinal Rushlew, you might have heard of him from um, Three Musketeers. Richelieu, oh, three musketeers, but he's actually based upon the first Duke of Richelieu and Fronsac, um, going back to fifteen eighty five France. Did and you never studied French or France or anything no. like history like no. that? Did you ever look them up like Todd just did? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was just oh. I'm sitting here googling no, because no. I wanted I, I wanted to make sure I don't get I the wrong information. <laughs> looking for things until I wrote the book right. because up until that point we never talked about it. Sure. It was, was don't bring it up. Now, why did... All right, let me ask you this. Why did you decide that now's the time I'm going to write the book? Because imagine this happening in your life, and your whole life you had to shut up. Yeah, I can't... Yeah. You never could You never could say to someone, listen, this is what happened. I'd see these paranormal investigators go to a house, and a chair would go, and they go, oh! <laughs> and I go, oh, God, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, really, that's it. And you if, should be a paranormal I investigator. Mean, these people, this nothing kills people. Nothing go to shakes a house, this woman. Yeah. They go to a house, they want to see something, and it happens, and they run away. That just frustrates me. Oh, I'm with you on that. Say, oh, yeah. What are you? What are you doing here? What, what What's going on? I want to know. That is one of the things I absolutely love about Debbie. Right. Is she and I are the types of people that something's going on down the hallway. You, you know, we go down see, down other other other, other, other people hallway, yeah. other people running we when we go yeah, exactly <laughs> in a horror movie. We'd be the first ones <laughs> out. But yes, we 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 hear a noise down the hallway. People run in the other direction, screaming "Ghost!" We're like, "Ooh, ghost!" and yeah, run directly into the room. Right <laughs> That's what we're. When I was just in Catalina Island, and there we we're doing the tour of the theater, and. My buddy Sean was like, all of a sudden the hair stood up on his arms, and he's like, "There's something in that room," and we both went, "Let's go see what's in that room." We walked right, into that that's, room. That's, I want to see. Isn't it. that a paranormal investigation? That's what Absolutely. it should be. Yeah, it's not getting scared. No, it's saying, "Oh wow!" Or you go, "Ah, okay, I want to check that of out." Of course, you're going to be startled. <laughs> yeah. that's just human nature. Exactly, be startled. But you know what? It's either you stay there or you run. And that's an investigator stays. You're yeah. right. Nothing shakes you. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Because I got to be honest, I would have been. I would have been shook to the core way earlier. You know what it was at the time? You have to understand also, I was my only defense of my family. And that put me in a different position. It had been different if I had been alone. That's true. You weren't thinking but about it wasn't, you. But I wasn't thinking, oh, you know, it was like nobody's touching my family. So it was like, you know, you got to get through me first. So that's what it was. That's how it all happened. You just, when you love something, you protect it. Sure. When Debbie's husband passed away is when you found the photos. Right. Which oh, is yes. what I was right. even thinking about that. This. I was cleaning out the cover. You're right, Jenny. Yeah, I mean, it, she kept, I mean, her husband didn't want to talk about it. This is not something he wanted to 
ever talk about or ever bring up, right? I mean, he, actually, in the la later years oh. of his life, he said, you know what, I'm going to write a book about this. Oh. Yeah, he did. He said, we really should write a book about this. But it never came to be because it was more talk. Sure. But he never told me he had the pictures. Yeah. And, and so then I was found... the cover and there was a, this box that I looked. And there, my, my kids didn't even know about this because they were babies when this was going on. And I got the pictures and I said, I got, I wonder if I should, so I said, I'm going to, so I told the kids the whole story, explained, showed them the pictures. And I said, you know what? I'd love to be able to tell this story now, but I wouldn't, if they, my kids said, no, if they said, don't do it. What if it comes back or anything? I wouldn't have done it. Sure. But they said, go ahead. And you're not afraid that he's, it's going to come back. Mr. Entity's coming back. No, he will come back. Yeah. He will come back. And it, all right. So to, to kind of tie up that loose end. So he went away with Gary at Gary's request, mm -hmm. but you don't think that he stayed with oh, Gary. No, he didn't stay with Gary. He hated Gary. He thought Gary was inferior. And I remember at the beginning, Gary in his, you know, where he went, he put the triangle over the door. Mm -hmm. And then after that, that's the only thing Gary told me, then Gary kind of let it go. You know, it was like, and I knew, I knew when I got near Gary the next time, Mr. Entity wasn't with him. Because I can always tell Mr. Where Mr. Energy. From so Mr. Energy. you think from the portal standpoint, if he went with Gary and then Gary sees the, the triangle, triangle with the tail, he left. that's him so getting out of there. That's he him did. bailing he out. He did. He left. I know he was over with Gary again. And <laughs> do you think he went to you back to your father-in-law, who at this point had left he might, here? He might have, because they had some things go on. He married another woman, and she left him because things were happening. So... You may have but you way. never got really detailed. No, I never happened. did. Never because I. But never it's could. also the question of was there more stuff here that was attached? I think there to was. Him. I think. Sure. I think yeah. Mr. I think, Ent so too. I think Mr. Entity was the big poncho, the general, mm -hmm. and then there were there's a lot of things that he told to do things that did things, because the impression I got was Mr. Entity was not in this dimension, he was in his own dimension. He couldn't come through. Oh. And, and from what I understand from the research that I've done, from the people that I've contacted, um. One particular one person in particular believes and he knows the identity of it, especially if you look at the 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 references to prints and everything. It's um, specific Efreet, um underworld the freed from the Alamar tribe. Now, if it's not Alamar himself, the references to call me Prince could be a uh, uh, an allusion to a prince of that tribe. Mm -hmm. And honestly, all of the the descriptions for the the phenomena. The, the the behaviors, the personality, really kind of points in that direction. So the more I've looked into it, I started looking into it and thinking, okay, probably demon. I mean, what else? Yes, that was my first. Thing. What else has the power to be able to do all these things? What else has the power to to to, to manifest these things in such a broad range of phenomena? Yeah. I mean, we're not talking about a human spirit, not a poltergeist, not a poltergeist, not a human spirit, not a phantasm, nothing yeah. like that. You know, you've got to really rule them out by measure of 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 the extremity. And the uh, duration. And the duration, exactly. And, and the so, name of Baal. And the name, yeah. name of Baal, which, yeah. you know, Baal, Baal, whatever you want to call him. Yeah. You know, look, looking as far back as you can, that's a Babylonian, Sumerian, Canaanite name. So which thinking perhaps... the reason why you and we never thought that the triangles were portals. We thought it was his name or his symbol. Exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. like, if you're thinking demon, like, why would the demon need to, you know... Stuff yeah, why would and, exactly like, why a demon, which is known to be in metaphysical circles, denser than a human, you know, than the who lives in a reality who that is denser than our current reality, why would it need to to, to use these symbols to to apport things? It, sure. it wouldn't need them, but at the same time, why would it seem to have general affection for a family, or at least a feeling of possessiveness over a family? Sure, you know, you're thinking demons. You think maybe. Um, torturing, you think uh, possessing, in, in general, some pretty horrible things. But you don't think about the, you don't think about it having a sense of humor and a personality or a gift giving. Exactly, and, and the gifts oh, to give, bring the gifts. Yeah, and the gifts weren't even here. You were on a vacation yeah, and it brought we were, you a gift. We went to Sedona to try to find help, and I wanted to go up to the top of Bell Mountain and get. A, I love rocks. Sure, I love rock. I just love rocks for some reason. Doesn't have to be diamonds or rubies. Just rocks. And I couldn't get up there. So when we got back home in the back of the van, there was this, and it was a funny because it's a triangle shaped mm -hmm. rock. It's about this big triangle, and he wrote the mirror a present for Debbie from Bell Rock, and he brought me a rock from Bell Mountain. And I've never heard of a demon giving gifts, never. but, but you know what? He used to bring me uh, jewelry, 
I went to a magic store once. There was this beautiful little jade, which I wish I still had, but Steve threw it away because mm. I had a break. Uh, this big of a, of a pyramid. Jade, it was beautiful, but it was like $250. And I looked at it and I said to my husband, that's nice, but I wouldn't pay that money. I got home and he left it for me. Wow. I mean, he brought me, he brought me, we were going, we were going to, to Tao or Vegas, I think it was. He brought me this big necklace. Remember the necklace? Mm -hmm. From one of the casinos before I, before I left. See, so he was strange. He would bring, and I remember one thing on the mirror said, more gifts to come. He would bring me gifts. Now, did you ever ask him for things? No. Oh, I did ask once. Uh oh. <laughs> you could do all these wonderful things, right? So I said to Bill, I'm going to ask him something. So I went and I said, Mr. Entity, as long as you're living here, how long would you give me the numbers to the lottery? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> you know? Pay your rent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, just give me the numbers to the lottery. And I left. I came back. He said, if you give me Lee, I'll give you the numbers. Ooh. <laughs> I said, never mind. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that's that's very telling right mm -hmm. there. I mean, oh, yeah, you want something bad enough, here's my price. Yeah. And then I thought to myself, why do I have to give you Lee? Why, how do I have the power to say you can't have Lee? I guess that's true. What? If... Yeah, why, why do you need my permission to have Lee? That's a really good point. Why? Said, so many things went on I just didn't understand, and I still don't. That's yeah. a really good point. What difference does it make if you said yes or no to that? Yeah, but looking at it, yeah, looking at it from another standpoint, though, if you looking at it from the standpoint of the uh, po the possibility that it was a gin, yeah, they there are reports in the past of gin being part of family units. Of there's a ritual. Um, I think it's probably, gosh, it's got to be pre Quran for the Middle East of a ritual for a human woman to marry a male jinn there's a there's a ritual specifically for the marriage between the two so there's i guess in the past at some point at least so understanding where they were they, they were a little bit closer tied to humans that there was some kind of more uh, intermingling between the two and in this case once again it kind of points in that direction where it makes a little more sense that yeah maybe it was maybe it was i have a question so mm -hmm. marriage great they also did rituals and sacrifices. I have not found anything about a sacrifice. Mm. That's he, the thing. I he, never saw anything about a sacrifice. He told me he couldn't come into this dimension. Okay, I was going to say, how he do you know was, that? He oh, was, right. couldn't come into this dimension. He needed the blood sacrifice. Oh, so the blood sacrifice was to for him to come here. It was to release him. Oh, my God. What would have happened if that would have happened? I have no Is idea. Is it a Ghostbusterous? <laughs> <laughs> Zool Gozer kind of thing? Like, I have and no clue. The thing clue. is, he has to have this to get out. And he can't oh, have it. Gotta it's have the mine. spear. It's mine now. As long as it's mine, he can't, he can't and touch it. And in the book, you said, uh, I forget who it was, somebody tried to steal the spear. Yes, Reverend David. He said, you don't know what you have. He said, you can use this in magic rituals. He said, the power I could have. Oh, my God. So that that's... All right, so... Thankfully, I did not have that same draw or pull to the spear. People I thought it was really neat, I and I'm like, cool. I showing this to people because there have been some people, people have had some extreme blood. reactions. Right, right the stable wanted to give a blood. Wait, what? Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, like them. stab themselves? Stab themselves. Oh my god! Yeah, let's try. Let's try feeding it and see what happens. And I don't think that's a wise idea over. either. I was like, you're going to show him the spear, right? I'm like, you can trust Kurt. He's not going to. Do, like, do something right wacky like, with it. Oh. It's not going to happen. She's like, yeah, yeah, I trust you guys. I'll, tr you know, I trust Kurt. So, you know, that's we... the furthest thing from my mind would be like, all right, I'm going to dive, blood. I'm gonna dive across the table thing? and stab yeah. Todd. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, you know? Sorry about stabbing my finger. As long as I have possession of it, he can't have it back. Yeah, it's a concern, though. It's like, mine. If, if people have done that in the past, it's a concern for her to bring that out to sure. any person. You know, she has to be careful. I... Matter of fact, I don't usually keep this around the house. I just had it here because you were coming. Well, th thank you for showing it to me. And thank God, like I said, I have no desire to. The last thing I'd want to do is if I would have accidentally cut myself, I would have freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah, but see, this is this is the key. It's like the key to the door to let him out. Weird, isn't it? What? So, see, it's a, so many things are so. And these are all, a lot of this is based upon what he said. So yeah. you have to question yeah. whether what's true and what's not. And but then, he seemed to be pretty honest and upfront honest about a lot of earthly. things. I said, "Why do you need this? I need it because it's. I need to come out. I can come over there. I can't come over without the blood sacrifice. I have to have it." 
And this came from, supposedly, as best we can tell, from the Congo. The Belgian Congo. I asked him, where was yeah. this from? He said, the Congo. Yeah. I went to the museum, and the guy said to me, this comes from the Belgian Congo. He said it's about 200, 300 years old. Yeah, he, he, I think he, he actually dated that at 200 and, between 200 and, 20, 200 and 225. Yeah. And I looked, when I, looking through all the thousands and thousands of photos that I went through from different, different um, collections across Africa, yeah, between 225 and 250 really is, is, is a really good estimate for that, a solid how, one. How would a gin connect to that? Good question. No idea. See, that's what I mean. Was it a gin? What was it? I don't know, but he never, he didn't come. He used to have things here that did things for him, but he couldn't come. He couldn't she come over. took it to the Natural History Museum. Yeah, the Natural yeah. History Museum in L.A. So, I mean, it's not like she's going to, like, a small little museum down yeah, the street. Or, or, or a psychology like, shop. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> she took it to the Natural History Museum is where they were yeah. dating it. And they never said, oh, it's a nice copy from Pure One Imports. She says, where did you get this? I said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Yeah, they they made note of the fact that there was no rust on it as well. I said, this is like brand new. Is it being put is. away? Did I they... said... I don't that, know. That was that was that was their own that was their only idea is that it was somehow well, it was created the, back then. We went back in time and got it. And <laughs> the, the, the 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 gentleman at the Natural History Museum, though uh, the professor there, the only idea that he had is somehow it was created during that time period and somehow it was sealed away this whole time in an, in in a method that would not accumulate rust on a pure iron blade. Or oil. There's no oil on it he either. Said, this, yeah. this is brand new. I said, I don't know. I just don't know. I just want to know about it. He said, I can tell you from the way it's sharpened, it hasn't been used for warfare. It hasn't been used for hunting. He said, it's sharp at the top. He said, with the decoration, this has been used for ritual magic. It's ceremonial purposes only. It's the same thing yeah. I came across. Did he want you to donate it? No, no. He was like, he just, he went and got another guy. He said, you got to see this. So the other guy came out. He said, Belgian Congo, right? He said, yeah. And then they said, where did you get it? And I said, as I picked it up and left, I said, you never believe me. And there's not. There wasn't even a question. Like it could have been from this this area, this area, this area. It was Belgian. two people, Belgian Congo. Congo. Mm-hmm. And he told me the night before it came from the Congo. He didn't say Belgian, but he said Congo. Referred to some one of the pictures. That's so bizarre. What is the connection? Like I said, this keeps giving me more questions than answers. It's and it's just and and half the stuff I don't even tell people because, when, like I said, when I started to write the book, I said to my kids, and I told them everything that happened. I said. Should I tell everything that happened? Because will people think I'm making it up because there's so much? Do you know what I mean? It's like I took a little from here, a little from here, but it all happened. Do I tell the truth? And Jessica said, tell the truth. That way, no matter what happens, you just tell the truth. That's exactly it. And like you said earlier, the story's not going to change because the story is what the story what is. Happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah, Debbie's talked to a lot of people and her story has not changed once. I've heard the story. I've ask questions you know nothing's changed i yeah no i've heard this story as well and it's the same story it's it because it happened i lived it i know what happened there's plenty of stuff i forgot because you have to remember yeah. oh, God, yeah. that minutes to hear like i said if i had kept all the pictures it was running account of every day we had a book he would write something on the mirror i'd write it down and take a picture of it and i think why didn't i keep that stuff because i didn't care about keeping it for history I wanted to get rid of Mr. Entity. Sure. So I did anything they told me. And they told you to throw stuff away, too. Yeah. yeah. Different people. Away, the, the problem yeah. is the, the, the legitimate investigators would come in and they'd say, document everything meticulously. And they'd, they'd do that. And then the the more spiritual-based uh, metaphysicians would come in and they'd say, oh, you're... you're, you're you all these items, all this, all this documentation is tying it to you. Get rid of everything, and then they get rid of it. And through that filtration process, Bill only kept like what, like maybe a couple of pictures yet of each oh, each, each set of events. Like, sure, there are two, three hundred pictures. I was going to say, but looking at these photos in front of me, there are yeah at least three hundred photos here, and it's still incredibly documented. If you were going to fake this, you'd have eight photos, a photo. You know, it's it's you can tell the stories that that pop up all the time where you're like, well, why didn't you take a million photos? This is the 80s. It's not the 60s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is a hundred, a couple hundred photos with yeah. proof. Yeah, to take with, it to go get developed. Yeah. Yeah. To do it yeah. And they're, and, and they're stamped. They're time stamped. Yeah. One thing about them, though, some of them are clear. 
but back then you didn't have like a you can look. Oh, this exactly. one's not clear. I better take another. And then no digital sure. cameras. You take a picture and hope it, hope it came yeah, out. Yeah, that, that's so the photo. That's yeah. the way it is. Then you had to take it to the developers and then wonder what they probably thought. <laughs> well, because they didn't. They probably didn't even bother looking at them because if you looked at those, if you didn't believe in the paranormal, you wouldn't even think. Oh, oh some, someone's writing yeah, on a mirror. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. right. even when I first thought saw writing on the mirror, I thought. Okay, one of Honestly, them yeah, who's right now? <laughs> okay, who's right now Honestly, there? a lot of these uh, somebody might look at and say, "Oh, somebody's vandalizing this poor this poor people's house <laughs> over and over." <laughs> but tell um tell a story how you figured out like okay, this no was, none of you in yeah, the family. This was when he first it. started writing. My mother-in-law was the first to find it. She was upstairs by herself. This is when it was kind of not too many things happening just at the first beginning. And she was cleaning upstairs and all of a sudden she yelled for me. I came running up. She said, look at this. And on the mirror, I'm trying to think what it said. The very first thing. I can't remember the very first thing. But one of the things was no escape. Oof. It was one of the things. And I said, well, who wrote it there? She said, I was up here by myself, cleaned the bathroom, went back, and it was on the mirror. So then we called Bill and the baby. Bill carried the baby up and her husband. We were all up there together. Now it's the bedroom up here is where she lived in the bedroom, and then you slide the door, and there's the bathroom. We were the only people in the house. We went in. We showed everybody what happened. We had to, I said, did you write this? We all questioned each other. Sure. No, we didn't write it. Don't be silly. Don't be stupid. And we cleaned it. We shut the door. We went back in. Nobody could, nobody could get in. We were right together. Nobody could get in the bathroom. Opened it back up, and there was writing again. Oh. So right there we showed. Yeah. It wasn't one of us doing it. Nobody else could be in the house doing it. And that's that we could see. That's why I asked that earlier. Was there ever a time where that was clean, then you walked in and it was and someone else saw it? So that right there for you skeptics listening, I know you're saying, Well, it's someone you guys looked away and somebody walked in and wrote it or you wrote it mm -hmm. or you're you know, you had a, a a mental snap and half you you know, you didn't mm -hmm. realize you were writing it. That's we what, together. four people? Four people. Wow. All together. Never out of each other's sight. Standing right by the door. Now, was there ever a time that anybody put, like, leave a video camera going in there? Or he did you try to do that? Anything that we used and throw it in the pool. Really? Yeah. Anytime. Like, um, we used to, we had the, one of the first ones was a uh, witch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she came. She would put a little thing up in the bedroom with candles and everything. Before she was out the door, he had thrown them in the pool. Wow. So, every, and what would what the pool guy think? <laughs> I mean, I mean, really. Every week he'd come and there'd be with everything that happened with that pool. I can't imagine. In the pool, and there'd be broken stuff in the pool. He must have thought we were nuts. Well, then when it would mold up and go oh, green, then and then black. he would cut the the pool guy's um, oh, that was, hose. That was another thing. It wasn't funny, but to me, it was funny. Yeah. He could that the pool turned black. I mean, black. It stunk. It was horrible. Our pool guy said, "I can't. I can't. There's nothing I could do." He quit. Wow. Got another pool guy. He put all kinds of chemicals, nothing touched it. Next one came said, I'm going to have to pump this out. So he brought this humongous hose to put in the pool and ran it out to the front to pump out the hose. <laughs> Mr. Entity in the night cut the hose in pieces. Oh, my God. Now, how are we going to explain to this guy that, oh, your hose is here, but it's now four pieces instead of one piece? How, what, oh do, what do you God. say? Well, we have a demon that does it or, a, or an entity that cuts hoses? And how do you explain, how did you explain the windows all being shattered out? Well, like, my father-in-law could put the windows in. So that oh, wasn't thank God. So we had windows break all the time. The only thing on his cars, because that's another thing. This is how he controlled us. We had a, uh, they had to go somewhere. We had to go somewhere, so we had to use two different cars. Um, he used to like to disable the cars so you couldn't use them. So we used to have to go and say, can, I, can we use the car tomorrow? Believe it or not, because he would break. So I said, listen, they have to use the truck tomorrow. Never my car. It would always be their car. Well, they have to use the truck tomorrow, so could you leave the windshield and the lights and everything in so they can use the truck? He said, okay, I won't break anything today, but tomorrow I'm, be I'm breaking the big window. Oh, my God. Did he break? The next one day he broke the windshield. But he, he said, for you, I'll let them take the truck just for the day. So that's how he could control us. I mean, what do you do? That's a great question. Do you, I don't do you, know. How, how do you, you fight back? How do you deal if with that? you get that? the experts in the field and they can't do anything. Dr. Paglini, who I, Dr. Paglini was awesome. 
I have to tell you, she was an awesome And for those lady. listening, this is Dr. Evelyn Puglini. Yeah, she She's another one of the people who investigated for a long period of time she, here. She came, yeah, she came. And Dr. Puglini never asked for one cent. She did everything. She came because she wanted to help. She came and she uh, she had us clean out one of the room upstairs that was the main room that he, like his bedroom. Okay, he had us, she had us clean it out, take all the furniture out. So at nighttime she came and she went up there and she was dressed in her robes and she had in the corner a statue of Pan. And each of us came up separately and she went over us and was detecting, she said, psychic energy. Uh huh. Okay, so she did all this. And then at the end she came down and she said, this is what you're going to have to do. This is the only thing I can suggest. You have to start paying it homage. Give it the bedroom. Tell them you will pay him homage. She said, this entity can make your life absolutely wonderful. She said, but you have to pay it homage. If you don't, I can't tell you that he's not going to, your mother-in-law is not going to die. So we sat there and mom right away, she, you know, she wasn't good. She said, no, I, we will not pay homage to anything like that. I only pay homage to God. And she said, I don't know what else to tell you. That's all I can, that's all I can do. I won't leave. She said, it doesn't have to leave. She said, right now there's somebody in the house that wants it here. That was my father in law. The father in law, yeah. Because he was trying he wanted it to torment my mother in law. He wanted it to kill her. So Just coming to grips with that alone is Yeah, I mean think about it. First first there's this entity in the house, and then you gotta worry about a father in law that wants your mother in law dead too. Goodness. I I, oh God! I didn't realize how long we've been going. I apologize. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have a, I, I, I know I have a million more questions, but I can't think of any because it's just this story is just so you, incredible. You can go home and think about them, and you're welcome anytime to come back. Oh, I appreciate that. I really am. I, I can't. I honestly, I can't thank you enough. This has been absolutely incredible and 100 percent belief. Like, there's not even a question in my mind. Just based on the photos alone, if I never saw or never talked to you or anything else. The photos alone are proof enough. The handwriting, the different types of handwritings from um, the other entity that that showed up to to help your mother in law. I mean, this story just has so many levels that it's it's impossible to get through in one sitting. It's, it's like half the, some of the stuff I never even brought up because, like I said, there were so many things that happened. So yeah. Many. Oh God, it's yeah. Like, it's unbelievable how much happened. Yeah, I, I, I'm 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 trying to look make sure I didn't miss any of the big questions that I had. And, and just to kind of give you guys a, 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 a like I said, a full wrap up of this. What year did what year did he finally go away? I can't remember if it was 93, 94, somewhere. 93, around. 94. Yeah. And he said I, he had to go with Gary. And he said the last thing he said to me was goodbye, my family. And, and that, that was that it. That was it. Never again. And Nothing that was ever it. Happened. After that, it was gone. And that, in a nutshell, hopefully you guys will go out and get the book because that book has way more information that we got to than we got to tonight. Um, but that in a nutshell is this most incredible story of Mr. Entity and, and Debbie. And I, again, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I can't thank everyone here so much for this. This is an incredible story that somebody needs to investigate. I wish I had the, the intelligence or the capacity to investigate this because this story needs to be figured out. There's got to be more to it. And I guarantee you that there's somewhere, something written that will tie to this story. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Kurt here again. I told you it was an incredible story, didn't I? I could have stayed there and listened to Debbie and Todd tell this story for hours more. And like I said, when I got there, she was telling me the story. She so generously was showing me the photos and would answer any question I had about any of the pictures, any of the symbols, any of the oddities that happened in these photos. And I'm telling you, somebody out there with the capacity and the knowledge can figure this out. I wholeheartedly believe that, and I wish it was me. I would like to be some small way part of figuring this out, figuring out who Mr. Entity was. This story is unbelievable. It's not the last that we hear from Debbie. I can guarantee you that. In the meantime, though, you guys all need to go out and buy this book called Unwelcomed, The True Story of the Moffat Family Haunting by Deborah Moffat. 
I'm going to put the link on Twitter. I'm going to put the link on Instagram. I'm going to put the link on Facebook. I never tell you guys to go out and buy anything. You guys need to read this book. You need to see the photos that are in this book. It is absolutely incredible. And there's so much more to the story than we got to. And this was a long episode. You guys have been begging me for a long one. Here you go. I was going to split it into two or three episodes. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't bear to have you guys hear part of the story. Then have to wait another week to hear the next part of the story. It's too good. Debbie's story, again, 100% believer. I was trying to debunk it. I was there. I was at her house, at the table where it happened, looking around. She shows me where the waterfall is on those stairs. There's nothing in that little closet. There's no pipes there. There's nothing that could have burst to cause a waterfall. There's photos of the, the light fixtures just pissing water. There is no possible way that unless there was a major plumbing thing that happened that she just completely forgot about, which there wasn't, there's no possible way there's an explanation for it, a rational explanation for it. Explanation for it. I'm flustered. That's how good the story is. Again, I'm not going to stop. Uh, unwelcomed, the true story of the Moffat family haunting. It's a gripping read. I read it in, I don't know, two, three days max. Um, and and usually I like to take my time with books. And this was, I was like, well, I got to get back to this book. I got to find out what happens next. I got to find out what happens next. It's incredible. This story is incredible. You're going to hear more about it. I guarantee it. If not for me, from everybody else, because this story is going to catch on and TV shows and movies are, I mean, everybody's going to catch on to this thing. And when they do, it's going to be the biggest story. This paranormal story of whatever Mr. Entity is or was is huge. And I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that you guys didn't mind that it was more conversational than a well, tell us what happened first, Debbie. Well, then what happened? And how did you feel? No, I didn't want to do that. When I got there and Debbie was so welcoming and so friendly, and like I said, going over every photo with me and just kind of chatting, I wished I had just turned the microphones on the second we got there and just let it be, just let it happen because it was that engaging. This is Debbie's true story that she loves to tell and you can hear it in her voice that she just wants the world to know the story and hopefully one day figure out what the hell happened to her and her family. So I hope you guys like this one. Uh, I do have a Patreon. It's called Paranormal Almanac. Find it on there. If you want to invest, that money's going to go towards better equipment or whatever you guys want. Uh, go to Patreon. Check it out there. Once again, I'm Kurt Sandvig, and this has been a very long, very incredible Paranormal Almanac. <laughs>